And we're continuing with the eighth chapter of The Face in the Frost by John Belairs. The two wizards went north. For days they rode across flat table land, where nothing but long yellowed grass and dusty goldenrod grew. In the distance you might see a tree or one of those tall watchtowers the northerners built. Those towers were not like anything seen in the south, round, narrow, and with pointed stone roofs. They looked like huge candles. Usually they had three floors connected by ladders that could be pulled up through the holes in case of attack. You could not hold out for long in them if you were besieged, but a fire could be lit on the upper story and the smoke could be seen for miles. Once Prospero and Roger found one of these towers planted next to the road on which they were traveling, it was night and there were soldiers outside sitting around a peat fire. They were not laughing, drinking, or telling stories. Instead, they sat, glumly, they sat grimly hunched over, poking the fire with their spears and wearing their acorn helmets. Long, narrow nose pieces, fire shadowed, made their, made their faces look evil. They must have heard the carriage rattling along miles away, but none of them looked up as it rolled past, spitting gravel. They were waiting for something else. The few scattered towns of the north were usually hidden under the lee of a low hill. Or you might find houses scattered through the trees of a little grove or grouped at the foot of a landscaped and terraced hill or farm, or farmed fields. On top, there was always a castle without battlements, a long oval wall of odd-shaped heaped stones, pieces of, pierced by crucifixion loopholes. The carriage passed several of these dumpy forts, but never came close to any of them. Prospero, using his brass-bound telescope, could see that the fields were untended and that the drawbridges were up. In the roadside towns, the wizards picked up stories and rumors. One man told how frost formed on the windows at night, though it was only the middle of September. There were no scrolls or intricate fern leaves, no branching overlaid star, star clusters. Instead, people saw seasick wavy lines, disturbing maps that melted into each other, and always seemed on the verge of some recognizable but fearful shape. At dawn, the frost melted, always in the same way. At first, two black eye holes formed, and then a long, a long steam-lipped mouth that spread and ate up the wandering white picture. In some towns, people talked of clouds that formed long opening mouths. One man in the town of Edgebrook sat up all night, staring at a little smiling cookie jar made in the shape of a fat monk. It stood on a high cupboard shelf, smiling darkly amid shadows. The man would not tell anyone what was wrong or what he thought was wrong. Doors opened at night inside some houses, and still shadows could not be cast by firelight. And still shadows that could not be cast by firelight fell across beds and doors. People who lived near forests and groves dreamed that the trees were calling to their children. In the daytime, pools of shadow that floated trembling around the trees seemed darker than they should have been. And when the children showed an unusually strong desire to play in the woods, panicked parents locked them indoors. Voices rose from empty wells, and men locked their doors at dusk. One night, after weeks of travel, Prospero and Roger were sitting around a fire they had made near a peat bog. Orion burned cold and tilted overhead in a sky that seemed emptier than it should have been. The chill was close around them, and even in their, wood, in their woolen high-collared cloaks, they felt that they were sitting in a wet cellar. There was none of the bracing, windy cold of the empty northern fields, just clinging, bad-smelling damp. Prospero was reading his large, handwritten book, and Roger, whose legs had gone numb, got up to walk around. He walked past the carriage and stopped suddenly. There was a man standing by the horses. He was wearing a coarse spun cloak and a furry hat pulled down over his ears, and he was touching the horses with the tips of his fingers, not petting them, just touching them to see if they were real. Roger stood there and watched him, his hand resting on the steamed up nickel surface of one carriage lamp. When the man looked up and saw the bearded face, gruesomely footlighted, he jumped back with a sucked in yelp as if he had slammed his hand down on a nail. Yes, said Roger, I'm real too, we won't hurt you. He was trying to look kind, but he felt more like laughing. Prospero got up and walked over to join them, his book slung under his arm. Then please, sir, said the man, if you too, sir, will see me home. I live five miles down the road and I'm afraid. What, bandits? 
Prospero asked the question, knowing that bandits would not be the answer. Come with me and I will show you. You are men of magic. I am not so foolish that I can't see that. There are no carriages like this on our roads. Come with me. All three men got into the dusty black carriage. Roger sat in the middle, holding the reins, and when they were sure, they had all their gear. He clucked it to the horses, and the wheels swished through the tall, wet weeds. The road they turned onto was a well-kept branch of the Great Way, a major highway broad enough for two wide wagons to pass. The stretch of it was bordered by a low wall of brown square-cut sandstone. The running lamplight flickered on a stone cross, one of the milestones marking the distance from the feasting hill to the brown river. Rigid stone saints, their faces washed empty by rain, clung to the wheel that bound the arms of the cross together. The farmer leaned out the window and pointed at the marker. It's not far now. Yes, there it is. They stopped at the edge of a walled graveyard. In the bright moonlight, a a slate-roofed chapel stood under the dripping yellow leaves of a huge half-dead willow. Prospero and Roger got out and followed the farmer over a rickety wooden stile. Inside the yard were narrow, roof-shaped tombs, replicas of the coffin lids that rotted below, flat, thick, ground-level slabs and church window-pointed uprights. Years of weathering had peeled the regular paper-thin layers from the slabs so that the remaining letters lay in puddles and islands of flint. The farmer, kneeling, pointed to a long stone that was cracked into six or seven jagged pieces. Look at these. Tell me what this means if you can. The broken words, some filled with dark blobs of moss, said, Empty, dark, hollow, doomed. All the gravestones were alike. The words repeated were the same. Nothing else was left. Roger gently grasped the man's shaking arm. Come, we'll take you home. As they left the churchyard, Prospero turned to look at the little chapel. The willow's limp strings were moving over the broken shingles in an ugly, caressing way. There were letters on the slates. It is not long till. He saw that till had two L's, had had two L's. The second had slid halfway down the roof. A few miles down the road, the carriage stopped at the farmer's cottage. A whitewashed oblong topped by two lumpy haystack haystack gables. In the two upper windows, scowling jack-o'-lanterns burned. Southerners had started the custom, and it had spread among folk who thought... uh, Amulets and hex signs were not enough to keep away night creatures. The Dutch door of the cottage was open at the top, and the strong-looking woman who leaned over the sill was silhouetted in orange firelight. She held not a broom, but a short pike pole. The farmer called to her. It's all right, Maria. These are friends. He turned to Prospero and Roger, who were ready to drive on. Why don't you stay here for the night? It's well past midnight, and we have a big empty bed upstairs. Our sons grew up a long time ago. Prospero looked at Roger. Why not? Taking turns sleeping in that bouncing hat box has left me a wreck. And you too, though you won't admit it, it's two days to the foothills of the mountains, but we'll run off the road before we get there. I suppose very well, but we've got to be up by six. First, though, we better hide the carriage in that barn over there. We don't want to call something down on these people's heads in return for their hospitality. What do you mean? It was the farmer speaking. Prospero and Roger looked startled. They had been alone on the road so long that they were used to discussing their private affairs aloud. Roger got down out of the carriage and drew the farmer aside. Nothing will happen, I assure you, if we get that carriage out of sight before nightfall. I can't explain this thing, but if you want us to go on and not stay, we will. I won't hear of such a thing, said the farmer. I've sheltered fugitives from kings and God knows who else. Besides, you're wizards, aren't you? Roger laughed and shook his head. (laughs) Maybe, maybe. Thank you for your hospitality. Not many people are willing to take in creatures like us these days. We'll cover up the carriage later. But first, I have to talk. I have to have a talk with my friend alone. We'll join you in a minute. The farmer went into the house and Roger went back to the carriage where Prospero was sitting. Listen, he said, whispering, I think it's all right for us to stay here the night. 
but I keep expecting things to pounce on us when we stop. Doesn't it seem strange to you that we haven't been attacked or followed? Yes, but remember how much the poor monk had to concentrate to get anything out of the book. Malicus may have given up on us. From what I can see, his work is progressing. Of course, he may be waiting for us to get to the cottage. He may, oh, let's not think about it till we have to. At any rate, I'm hungry. Let's go in and eat. He got out of the carriage and followed Roger into the house. As they walked up the path, Roger pointed up to the bucktooth pumpkin faces. If we had one of those, we'd be traveling in a state coach. Prospero managed a little smile. He was thinking about the lettering in the churchyard, and he knew Roger was forcing cheerfulness. Later inside, the two travelers from the south sat at a smooth pine table, talking to the farmer and his wife over the ruins of a large veal and ham pie. It was Prospero's private and cranky repeated opinion that veal and ham pie was next to tastelessness to was next in tastelessness to raw potatoes, but he had forgotten that opinion this evening with the help of a sharp brown sauce made from quinces. Roger usually warned Prospero about the effect of condiments on his stomach, but tonight he kept quiet because his friend was beginning to come out of a dangerous depression that had been on him since the bridge wrecking incident. Part of the reason for Prospero's sudden cheerfulness was the unlikely interior of the house. The farmer, it seemed, was a woodcarver, and he had filled the shelves of this long, low room with scenes from local mythology. Fat saints shoved pigs through fences, elderly ladies pelted ogres with rocks, drunken kings dropped chairs out of the window onto wandering minstrels, but the best thing of all in the room was the clock over the mantel. A Nuremberg circus of cows with clacking jaws, stumbling ducks, frantically dancing angels, and waltzing bishops. In the center, in the center window over the dial, was a little man who kept missing the belt with his hammer, the bell with his hammer, as the bell bobbed up and hit him on the head. All this, at least, is what the farmer said the clock was supposed to do. It wasn't running, and when Roger asked why, the farmer's wife pointed at the dark window. Prospero sat there with a strange look on his face. He got up and walked the length of the room to the fireplace. As he stood there for, for several minutes, toying with the jolted wooden dolls, with the jointed wooden dolls. Then, grasping the mantle, he leaned up on tiptoe and put his lips to the keyhole in the side of the clock. He whispered so softly that no one in the room heard him. Melicus is a fool. Picking up the wooden crank, Prospero wound up the clock and set the pendulum swinging. The cows flapped their jaws inanely. The ducks stumbled uncertainly over the wooden platform. Bishops waved their croziers and clicked their heels. And Prospero, shoved the hands to twelve, and Prospero shoved the hands to twelve, the bewildered wooden man swung twelve times at the painted bell and missed while the bell caught him twelve times on his shiny brass nose. Prospero went back to his seat, went back to his seat. Prospero went back to his seat. I think, he said, that I will sleep better tonight. The next morning, at the chilly hour of six, Prospero stood in the front room of the cottage, thanking his host, while Roger hitched up the horses and brushed hay off the carriage. The farmer had a tin box in his hand, and he was tapping it as he talked. I didn't think of this till morning. We, my family, have been living in this house for several hundred years, and a long way back, an old man spent the night here. He did all sorts of strange things, like cleaning out a poisoned well and making the fire burn different colors. We've got all his all this written down. Now, before he left, he gave us this key and said that a man with the initial of P should have it. Lord knows we've had enough people here that filled that bill, even in my lifetime. Pruitt, Pillion, even Pickthatch. But I have a feeling you're the one who's supposed to get it. And if you're going north, try to, to try to do something about what's been happen, about what's happening. I didn't say that said Prospero. Please don't spread rumors like that. I won't, said the farmer, smiling. I wouldn't even if you had told me that, even if you had told me what you're doing. At any rate, here it is. Prospero opened the banged up tin box. Inside, wrapped in a blackened rag, was a little brass key. The teeth were cut into a cross pattern, and except for a green crust in the molded ridges of the handle, the key was shiny. There was an inscription on the barrel in squat unsealed letters, but it was written in what looked like Welsh. Prospero excitedly handed the key to Roger. 
Look, you know Welsh, what does it say? Roger looked at it, holding it up in the bluish morning. Yes, it's Welsh. It says, Gwethian of Caerleon made me. Turn twice. There, does that help you? Prospero put the key in the buttoned inner pocket of his heavy cloak. No, he said, no, he said, not much. He turned to the farmer. Tell me, did the old man have a Scottish accent? I wouldn't know what if I heard it, sir. My ancestors wouldn't have either. There's no record that any of them ever left this country hereabouts, much less the northern kingdom. They wouldn't know a Scottish accent if they heard it. I see. Well, thank you very much. And if you wonder what I was doing out back, I was laying down a little spell that will make your dandelion wine the best in the country next year. And use those pentacles I drew for you. They'll keep out many things, though I doubt if they'll help with what we're, we're all worried about. Good luck to you, shouted the farmer as they drove out into the crunch, onto the crunching gravel. Prospero leaned out of the shield-shaped door, his foot on the round black carriage step, and reminded him that reminded him of a musical note. He waved and shouted goodbye until he could no longer see the humpy loaf of a farmhouse. And then he sat down next to Roger. For a long time, he did not say anything because he was thinking of the key in his pocket. And that is the end of chapter eight.